I uh, developed a cold this morning. I'm pretty sure it was my two-year-old. In all of his wisdom, felt like it was a good idea to pass his sickness along to me before I spoke in chapel for the first time. So if I have to uh, clear my throat or take a sip of water, um, I apologize in advance, especially if it sounds kind of gross. <clears throat> you can apply a lot of different labels to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> he was an influential writer, a civil rights leader, a phenomenal speaker, but he now has a place in the canon of national heroes. But first and foremost, King was a minister of the gospel. A lot of people gloss over this aspect of King and list his secular influences like Thoreau and Gandhi. But if you miss the fact that his foremost influence was Jesus, then you will never truly understand King. During the 1955 through 1956 Montgomery bus boycott, a young King, who was just 27 years old at the time, got word that his house had been bombed. King had been made leader of the Montgomery bus boycott, and as leader, he was the most prominent, although not the only, but the most prominent target. At the time of the bombing, King wasn't home, but his mother-in-law, his wife, and his young child were. King rushed home to find that they were okay. It turns out that they had heard a loud noise on the porch, and just in the nick of time, had started running towards the back of the house when the bomb exploded. Now at that pivotal point in civil rights history, King had a choice, and he had to decide what to say to the crowds that had gathered on his lawn and whose numbers were continuing to swell. Now, if you don't know, the Montgomery bus boycott was the first major direct mass action event in the modern civil rights movement. And so it's very early on in civil rights history. And many of those people who had gathered on King's lawn after the bombing were ready to retaliate. The sources tell us that some people had guns, other people had broken bottles. Now, even though this is early on in the bus boycott, by this point, King was getting about 30 to 40 pieces of hate mail every day. And every day, he was getting at least 25 obscene phone calls. Now, some of these threats in the mail and on the phone talked about how they were going to murder King talked about how they were going to murder his wife or how they were going to murder his little girl. He had gotten a call where someone said they were going to bomb his house, and now his house had been bombed. Guided by Jesus, and in my opinion, there's really no other way to explain how you could do what King did, given that his family had nearly been murdered. King went out to the crowd that had gathered on his lawn. And he lifted up his hand and he spoke to them. When he lifted up his hand, they quieted down and he said, I want you to go home and put down your weapons. We cannot solve this problem through retaliatory violence. We must love our white brothers no matter what they do to us. We must make them know that we love them. Jesus still cries out across the centuries, love your enemies. This is what we must live by. We must meet hate with love. Now at that moment in civil rights history, events could have dramatically veered off course, veered off towards a violent course, and yet King redirected them because he was determined to respond the way that Jesus had modeled Years later, in 1963, when King organized peaceful, nonviolent protesters in Birmingham, Alabama, he required anyone, to, anyone who wanted to participate to agree and sign a 10-point pledge. Now, these 10 points are infused with Christian sentiment. I like point one the best. He starts off by focusing their hearts and minds, by telling them to, quote, meditate daily, 
on the teachings and life of Jesus. Point three says to walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. And point four says pray daily to be used by God. Now, for African Americans living in Birmingham in 1963, violent attacks and abuse were the norm. Birmingham was called the most segregated city in America. It was a place where crimes against African Americans were constant. There were so many unsolved bombings in Birmingham in the years before King showed up that the city had earned the nickname Bombingham. It was a place where peaceful marching downtown was reciprocated with arrests. The police would jab the marchers with cattle prods and they unleashed their German shepherds on them. The firemen were called to come in and disperse the crowds by spraying them with hoses that packed a hundred pounds of pressure, which is enough to rip the bark off of a tree. King knew that if they were going to keep up that spirit of nonviolence amidst this intense form of physical and mental oppression, they'd have to have a perfect model that faced down things like this before them. Now, I'm not saying that Gandhi was not an influence on King. Gandhi was an influence, and it was admirable for Gandhi to resist the British. But it was a whole different level for Jesus, having suffered all of those abuses at the hands of the Romans, to utter, Father, forgive them, while hanging from the cross. This was the inspiration for King, and this was the inspiration he wanted to spread to others. Now, I first read Martin Luther King Jr.'s seminal piece, The Letter from Birmingham Jail, nearly 20 years ago, back in 1996, whenever I was a college freshman. And I read it for a class called Christian Ethics. Now, The Letter from Birmingham Jail is required reading for college students across the country. And even though it's just a little more than 50 years old at this point, it's already considered a great work. That's quite an honor for a document that was composed on any old scrap of paper, including toilet paper, that King could find in his cell and then that he could smuggle out of that cell. It doesn't take long in the letter from Birmingham jail to find the permeating Christian overtones. It is, after all, a letter King wrote to white Christian ministers who penned an article in the local newspaper that criticized King and what he was doing. Even though what happened in Birmingham was not very long ago, I hope that everyone in the audience here finds it strange and finds it hard to understand how white Christians could be opposed to black Christians. And it must have hit King very hard to evoke such a strong response and, and to create this great piece of writing while he was incarcerated. Now, I don't know about you all, but I feel that the attacks that come from people who you thought were your brothers and sisters seem to sting more than the ones that you can see coming. To counter their rebuke, King lists a host of religious precedents from theologians like Niebuhr and Aquinas to biblical examples like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I've read the letter from Birmingham jail maybe 15, 16 times, maybe more, and I can hardly get through it without crying. In fact, I kind of wondered whether I should include an excerpt from it here in this chapel presentation because I really didn't want to break down and have to pause and compose myself. Just thinking about this part that I'm about to share with you caused my face to convulse and tears to start coming out of my eyes whenever I was writing this speech. Those white ministers and many others in Birmingham and across the nation at the time wanted King and other African Americans to wait now, I've read a lot of accounts of the Sermon on the Mount, and a lot of theologians argue that the purpose of Jesus' instructions to turn the other cheek were to make your attacker look you in the eyes. 
they backhand you and you have to turn and face them and they have to look you in the eyes while you show them your other cheek. And in that way, it pricks their conscience and hopefully changes their hearts and they see what they've done to you. King tried to do this. And King tries to do this in the letter. You can feel the pain in his writing when he says this. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you've seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you've seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million black brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that's just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she's told that Funtown is closed to colored children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little middle sky, and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who's asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you're humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Those words have always been emotional for me, but they've become even more emotional since I've had kids. <clears throat> I have three boys, and they're one quarter African American. Now, I think parents in general want to shield their children from the evils of this world as long as possible. My sons are seven, five, and two, and I try to do that all the time. But last year, with the uh, overt displays of Confederate flags here in Searcy that followed the shooting in South Carolina, my children started asking questions similar to what King describes in this passage. And it breaks my heart every time I have to give them even a little bit of an answer. King envisioned a world that's more aligned with the kingdom of God. In his famous I Have a Dream speech, he talks about harmony between all people. The efforts of King and all the others who made a stand through the suffering in Birmingham helped propel the bill that became the 1964 Civil Rights Act. This law, signed by President Lyndon Johnson, made segregation in public facilities illegal. Now, from a historian's standpoint, 1964 is not that long ago. And while changing the law was essential, it was just a part of a process that is ongoing even today. We're wrong if we think that the work is complete when a law is changed. Because real change only comes when we allow Jesus to work through us to change people's hearts. In the Gospels, Jesus emphasizes how loving others is like loving God, and how doing things for others is like doing something for him. I'm a fan of the theologians Harawas and Willimon, and in a few of their works, they argue that the story we tell, the story we tell ourselves, the story we tell others, will determine how we live our lives. I want you to understand that King is a part of our story, not just as Americans, but as Christians. And as Christians, we realize that there's always work to do in the kingdom. For as much was accomplished back in the 1950s and 1960s, we realize there is still a long, long way to go concerning reconciliation and the eradication of racism. In the letter from Birmingham Jail, King writes about how the early church passionately stirred up things to create change. But he laments that the church of his day had become, for the most part, a mirror to the values of society. So he challenges the Christians of his day with a charge that still rings true in our day. <clears throat> 
He wrote, quote, If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, <clears throat> and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning. We must be a bright, shining light and not a dim reflection of the world around us. When I started working here at Harding back in 2007, the university did not dismiss classes for MLK Day. But that very year, this campus saw a change. The Student Association put forward the proposal to observe the holiday, and that spring, the faculty took the much needed step towards observing this day. That first year that I taught here, we met for classes on MLK Day. <clears throat> and so I spent class time talking about King, about his contributions, and about his importance to our story. And after class, an African American student came up to me and she had tears of joy pouring down her face. Tears were streaming down and she thanked me for speaking about King because it meant so much to her that one of her professors had talked about him. Now it turns out that this made quite an impression on all of the students in that class because at the end of the semester, after classes were over, I read my teacher evaluations and more than a few students wrote, made a girl cry in class. They didn't understand the positive impact that that presentation had had on that particular student. And when the faculty discussed observing the holiday, not everyone understood why we would take off a day of classes so early in the spring semester. Some of you might not understand why we get a day off a week into classes in the spring semester. When I came to Harding, I already had strong feelings about how we should get MLK day off, but after that student came up to me, after that class, it was crystal clear. As Christians, we're especially thankful that King <clears throat> steadfastly practiced the love, forgiveness, and nonviolence of Jesus so that our country could be reminded how to treat enemies and how, through Jesus and his methods, our nation could begin the process of real healing and progress. So we celebrate and remember him and the multitudes of others in the movement who experienced abuse without repaying it with violence so that our country did not descend into a deep abyss of turmoil and strife. And we remember that every one of us has a part to play for there's still much today to do. I ask that on Monday, when you're not in class, when you're not in chapel, that you'll take a little bit of time to reflect on these things and think of the ways that you can do things for Jesus by doing things for others. Thank you for coming to chapel today. You are dismissed.